Good morning, everyone. This is Mike Cranky, Program Director for the Sustainable Forest Education Cooperative out of Cloquet, Minnesota. And we have a nice day today, a little bit of snow in Cloquet. It looks like we've got about a half an inch and it's still snowing, so it'll be good for the deer hunters, those of you that are, are uh, still deer hunting. We have a nice audience today of about 22 individuals uh, from around the state. Um, a lot of DNR foresters, some uh, ecological um, and water resources, uh, DNR, private consulting forester, Minnesota, uh, University of Minnesota Twin Cities, um, tribal forester in Grand Portage, uh, a person from the Superior National Forest. Um, so we have a, a very good audience today, so welcome. Our speaker today uh, is Jana Albers. She will be speaking on forest insects, disease updates, and climate change impacts on insects. Jana is a very uh, deep uh, expert in this field. Uh, she's been trained as a forest pathologist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her job title is forest health specialist, and she works for the Minnesota DNR. Uh, she has worked in this capacity for 30 years covering insect, disease, weather, human-caused impacts of trees and forests. Over her career, she has worked in all the counties north of the Twin Cities. So we're fortunate to have Jenna Albers with us today to do the presentation on forest insects, disease updates, and climate change impacts on insects of Minnesota. So Jenna, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Mike, and thanks for the nice introduction. And uh, welcome to everybody. It's, it's nice to read through the list and see the people that I know. And welcome to all my friends. Um, I'm going to be talking today on the forest insects and disease, uh, give you an update. And what I um, in the chat box on the left-hand side of your screen, uh, you can type questions in as you have them. But what I'd prefer to do today is to uh, keep all the questions to the very end and work on them then. Um, otherwise, we might get too distracted and we might not finish uh, the talk. So let me see if I can make the computer work here. OK, it's not clicking through, Jeannie. OK, go back one. All right, there we go. All right, um, I'm going to be talking um, <clears throat> about these topics. And what I've done is kind of giving you a, a brief outline here of what we're going to be talking about. The first thing I'm going to talk about is the results of our aerial survey this year and including some acreage trends over the last few years. I've got about 11 damaging agents that we're going to talk about today. Then I'm going to talk about what's new with three invasive exotic insects and diseases um, for this year. And also I'm going to give you some um, examples of potential impacts of climate change on forest insect populations and their host trees. Oops, wrong direction. All right. Now, the first one I'm going to talk about um, in terms of the results of the aerial survey are spruce budworms. Spruce budworms cause a prolonged defoliation of balsam fir and white spruce and cause extensive mortality. Uh, spruce budworm outbreaks are perennial in Minnesota, unlike anywhere else in the United States and Canada. And in the chart below, you can see the acreage trends that we've got back to 1954. And a little bit below that, you can see the lines uh, where the population centers were. And the population centers move around. And um, right now, it's in kind of the northern St. Louis County area. But the population centers move in a counterclockwise direction over a period of about a 45-year cycle. And there's three main locations uh, in Minnesota. It goes from St. Uh, Southern Lake in St. Louis County to Cook County to uh, the broad sweep on uh, northern St. Louis County, maybe into Cuchitin County, and then back down into uh, southern Lake County and southern St. Louis County. Uh, since 2006, we've had a core area averaging about 115,000 acres of defoliation per year. This year, we had about 136,000 acres of defoliation. And you can see the trend there in the chart. Um, in 2001, we also mapped uh, 92,500 acres of mortality uh, resulting from the defoliation probably over the last three to four years. And uh, that's about what we expect to find out there. If you look at the map, I've also got a little red circle. And that's indicating the population center 
um, we think that's moving down into the Southern Lake, Southern St. Louis County area, which will probably be there for another the next 10 to 15 years and slowly uh, diminish from that northern area. And then um, you'll find most of the defoliation down in that area. We will continue to have mortality up in the northern cent central St. Louis County. Jack pine bugworm. This is a defoliator similar to its cousin, spruce budworm, and it consumes jack pine needles primarily. And we detected no defoliation in 2011. And in fact, we've just come off of a big um, outbreak and up to over 70,000 acres of defoliation uh, in 2005. And at the map on the right, you can see that it was a statewide outbreak that we had quite a bit of defoliation. Um, the pattern is that we probably won't see defoliation for the next one or two years. And then we'll start another cycle over in the west central part of the state. Eastern larch beetle. This is an, an insect, a larger bark beetle type insect, that kills tamarack by mining in the phloem layer. This year, 17,300 acres um, were um, killed, new acres of uh, mortality. This is an opportunistic pest um, that attacks stressed trees and storm damaged trees. We've had an outbreak in Minnesota since 2000 that has killed tamarack on about 123,000 acres. And in the picture on the right below, and if you have uh, a decent color interpretation on your screen, and I don't know if you do or not, but along the, the far bottom right edge is uh, gray dead trees. And then you'll see a, a layer, a, a pattern there of light green trees. Those are the trees um, that are going to be dying next year. And we did our aerial survey late this year because of the government shutdown. But this also a lot, had some benefits and had some detriments. But one of the benefits was that we did be, we were able to pick up and map the areas of defoliation or areas of uh, impact that are going to be dead next year. So that was a, a, a big thing for us to find out. But we don't really know what's the underlying cause of the eastern larch beetle outbreak in Minnesota. So in 2010, uh, formal studies were initiated by the University of Minnesota researchers led by Dr. Brian Akama. And they're going to be lo looking at both insect biology and at site and stand conditions that lead to tamarack mortality. We're pretty excited about it, too. Large case beer. This is a naturalized exotic defoliator of young and small tamarack. Uh, its natural enemies were also introduced really decades ago, and had controlled the foliation pretty well. It was pretty uncommon prior to 2000. Um, and then we started seeing a, a tick up in the population, and it peaked in 2009. And unlike other Midwestern states, case bearer is not associated, associated with large beetle impacts. And again, I'll, I will bring this up um, when we talk about the impacts of climate change, and, and you'll see why we're even thinking about this. Bark beetles. Um, these are beetles, uh, insects, uh, the larvae of which kill pines by mining in the phloem and the sapwood. They're an opportunistic pest on red and jack pines during droughty weather or after summer pine thinnings or after uh, both of them when they occur together. And if you look down in the chart below, you can see the typical pattern of an opportunistic pest. If you recall, we had uh, droughty, droughty weather in 07, 08, and 09, which was very droughty in 09. And that's when we had the peak of the um, impact, the mortality, by this opportunistic pest. And then with the uh, rains and the tree health improving, you had a peak uh, steep up, and then you had a, a steep uh, peak back down, or a, a decrease back down to a lo lower level. That's kind of the typical example of that. And in Minnesota, um, we found over the years, probably the last 30 years, um, that the greatest threat um, is really along more of an ecological gradient from the northwest to the southeast um, in the state. And you can see that in the map on the right in the circled area. Those would be the, the areas that we'd expect to have most damage, and we do have most damage in our red pine and jack pine plantations. And you can see that was the peak year of 2009, when we had more than 3,500 acres of mortality. The next topic is forest tent caterpillar. 
Um, this is a defoliator of aspen, birch, oak, basswood, cherry, tamarack, white pine, etc. And you can see the picture of the caterpillar on the right side. We have two outbreak areas, kind of a north-wide and then a west-central um, outbreak area. And on the left column there, you can see the historical record of kind of those big north-wide outbreaks that we've had in Minnesota back to 1891. And this northern area has an outbreak cycle of averaging 10 to 16 years. And you can see that in the, the, uh, the right hand, what I'm talking about is a north-wide outbreak, the red area there. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's what it looks like um, in, a ma in a map. But the defoliation is pretty profound when it does occur. It's uh, pretty much all the trees except for the red maples. And when you fly over, you can pretty much map out the red maples, everything down to the grass, the shrubbery and everything. So it's a pretty, pretty thorough defoliation and hence fertilization of the area, too. Um, we, I did chart, show you a chart of the last northwide outbreak. And that's um, the peak there in 2002 was 7.75 million acres. That's about half the forested area of Minnesota. So it was a, it's a pretty broad swath when it, when it hits. Right now, though, our current FTC outbreak is in the west central counties. And basically, if you look carefully at, on it, it's pretty much that uh, Iowa lobe of the last glaciation. Um, it's uh, not really cyclic out in this area. You can always find a few hundred or a few thousand acres of defoliation out there. But we have had kind of a bona fide outbreak there for the last few years. And again, you can see that we've, when the drought is, is, is uh, worsening, you get a higher population of these defoliators. Uh, they're really not an opportunistic pest, but they do better in dry weather. Um, in the west central areas, the population outbreaks usually don't persist very long in a given location, maybe one or two years, and then they kind of move on down the road. And they're usually associated with forests along the lake shores and wetlands and in nearby woodlots. Now this year we had uh, about 61,400 acres uh, mapped, but you'll notice that I have a question mark on the top um, of, our, of the bar in uh, 2011. And this is because our aerial survey was um, over a month late. Uh, basically due to the government shutdown. So mappers had trouble distinguishing trees that already had refoliated um, from those that hadn't been defoliated in the first, uh, first part. So this is a very conservative estimate of the amount of defoliation out there. And I would say it was at least as much um, as 2010 just by you know, the ground survey that they did out there. Two-line chestnut borers. This is an insect, um, another opportunistic insect, but it's on oak, um, contrary to its name. And it's oak stressed by drought under defoliation. Again, it mines in the phloem layer, and it, it causes mortality. Um, the outbreaks are very localized and intense, really related to um, rain um, in this case. Um, when you have a multi-year event of, of drought, you'll have the red oaks being affected first. They'll start um, dying back and then having full tree mortality, then the white oak and then the bur oaks. This year we only had 59 acres of mortality reflecting the two years of um, good spring rain and summer rains. Um, and you can see that the that buildup and then big crash of the population just showing uh, along with the drought kind of a typical pattern for an opportunistic um, insect. Oak wilt. Um, this is a vascular wilt, which causes the death of oaks. It's caused by a fungus. And the fungus is now thought to be exotic, not a native one like we were all taught in school. Basically, red oaks die in one season, and they, spread, uh, they can be spread two ways. Long distance um, by firewood and by insects, and short distance by root grass. So when you're flying over it or you're walking through the pocket, it looks like a circular pocket, a roughly circular pocket of dead oaks on the ground. It can be easily confused with two-line chestnut bore symptoms. Expect that the leaves discolor. And you can see a picture of that uh, up there at the top. They uh, discolor and fall really suddenly in July. So our aerial survey was uh, mid-August this year. So basically, the detectable leaf symptoms had already occurred, and that's why we have a very, very low number. We don't really think that the number of um, outbreak uh, pockets changed, um, but um, 
we, we just flew pretty, pretty darn late for it. And so you can see that we have a map and then an inset map that it's really peppered in that uh, east, north and east uh, of the metro. And it's very, very lightly scattered elsewhere down to and into Winona County. We don't know any other locations other than these um, in uh, Minnesota. I'm going to change up a little bit and talk about abiotic agents. Um, and the first thing I want to talk about is ash decline. Ash decline um, is not caused by insects or fungi. And studies have shown that it's site and climate related. And what you get is a lot of dieback and epicormic branches in these declining ash stands. And it's um, pretty much due to the fluctuating water tables in these shallow basins shallow basin ash stands. And oftentimes, you can find these declining and healthy ash stands can be found very close together with just a few feet of topography difference. You can see, see we mapped uh, 25,600 acres of that this year, and it's very similar to what we've been mapping um, in, in previous years. Aspen decline. We started noting this in 2004 across all of the north and the northeast counties. Um, all the way over to basically Roseau County, in fact. And it was likely related to that earlier FTC defoliation that I showed you that peaked in 2002. And we've had a prolonged drought across the north, and especially in the Arrowhead region. And so that's why we think our uh, aspen up there is um, you know, it's very, very vulnerable. And it has an opportunistic test that comes in the bronze aspen borer. So the tree crowns uh, look better or worse, depending on the spring and the fall. And you can see that effect. It's this opportunistic test kind of look again with it peaking in 09 and tailing off down into this year when we had uh, two good growing seasons um, until this fall for trees. Of course, we flew when it was pretty nice out still. So we mapped about 57,000 acres of aspen decline this year, and it really focused in on lake and County. And the final um, aerial survey topic I want to cover is the blowdown in St. Croix, the St. Croix Valley. In July, there were the picture is that the uh, storm front that occurred that day on July 1. There were straight line winds clocked at 100 miles an hour. It was a really fast moving storm. It took 32 minutes to traverse the area starting in Pine County. Western Pine County, Minnesota, and then ending up in Bayfield County, the Apostle Islands. And it hit St. Croix State Park square on. Um, luckily, it was during the government shutdown, so there were no people there to be injured. July 19th, we had another straight line wind event, and additional blowdown occurred in the county. So we totaled about 185,500 acres uh, affected by the storm. Foresters have done um, more than 50% of the work in, in creating salvage sales right now. Well, as of mid-October, they had 110,000 cords um, up for sale. Um, they're having two auctions a month. Um, the plans for regeneration are primarily natural regeneration. But where there's very nice red oak, they're going to be planting it. And they're going to also be planting jack pine in St. Croix State Park. That came from state, the seed which came from St. Croix State Park that was produced by our nursery. And I thought I'd show you just a couple of pictures what happened. Uh, the first thing, if you start in the lower left, is they went in and cleared the roads. And that was a big job. And then if you go up from that, you'll, um, this is an aerial shot of the trees that were just blown over. The one on the right, we had a lot of stem breakage. And then the last picture is um, under there, there's a building at St. John's Landing. And pretty much the whole uh, campground was uh, demolished, too. So pretty impressive damage from uh, a single storm. OK, so we have, um, now we're going to change topics. And we're going to go to uh, insect, invasive insects and pathogens. And I just want to just have a little uh, brief introduction to them as, as a group. Um, Non-native insect species uh, may cause environmental and economic harm because they become established and can spread quickly. Uh, increasing global trade has increased the number of non-native pests traveling to North America. And with quicker travel and better travel, uh, more 
know, and they don't spend as much time in, in transit, many more of these pests are arriving alive and in good condition and ready to go. So the problem with them is that they're more likely to cause serious damage than native pests. First of all, our tree species lack their natural defenses against them. They've built up natural defenses against native pests, but these are novel relationships, and then uh, the, usually the invasive has the advantage. And the exotics also arrive here without their natural enemies to control them. So basically, they have all the food to eat and none of the constraints on their population, let's say, other than weather or the limitation of the distribution of their food. And if you look at the invasion curve there on the right, um, you'll see the introduction, detection, public awareness usually begins. And also, when eradication is feasible, when it's unlikely, and when you get local control is management only. You're not, you're, it's now going to become naturalized in the environment. So really what it, this whole graphic is showing is that early detection and rap, rapid response to new invasives are much more cost effective and better for maintaining the health of affected forests than attempting control later. So I'm going to talk about three, uh, I've selected three of the invasives to talk about today. They're probably the ones that are foremost in everybody's mind. And we'll look at gypsy moth first. This is an, obviously an exotic insect. And the interesting thing about this is that the females can't fly. So it really has a limited population movement. But we are finding that, um, that there can be long distance spread. These uh, little tiny larvae are easily transported by winds. Um, very, when they're very small, when they come out, they're very small when they come out and they um, can if they're blown off the branch, they can start spinning uh, long threads of silk. And then these act as, I don't know, kite strings or whatever. But they're very light, and they can fly. And they've actually done some experimentation um, over the last couple of summers over Lake Michigan. And basically, they're finding that these little guys can travel about 90 miles in four hours with these low-pressure storm fronts, land and land alive and happy, and uh, they, they survive. So the females don't fly, but apparently the larvae can. So <laughs> you'll see uh, why I'm bringing this up in just a few minutes. Well, anyway, they cause prolonged hardwood defoliation, which can cause um, extensive mortality, especially in their preferred hosts, oak, aspen, birch, basswood, and willow. MDA right now is the lead agency for the detection, regulation, and mitigation of gypsy moth uh, problems. And eventually, the DNR will take over when it becomes more of a management issue. Gypsy moths have been found in Minnesota since 1973 and 74, and they've always been locally eradicated, and MDA has been doing that. We do not have any defoliation yet in Minnesota, and we do not have any quarantines either. So I've, I've got two graphics here, and the top one is a trapping, the pheromone trap, um, where, we, where we've been trying to to catch these gypsy moths, and this is how we detect populations. MDA puts out 20,000 of these traps at least per year, primarily across the eastern half of the state. And you can see the little blips on the bottom where we've, you know, these are moth trap catches. On the right, as you get into um, 2006 and beyond, that reflects the invasion of um, the North Shore, likely from the Bayfield Apostle Island infestation as the little larvae are blown over um, into Minnesota from that area. The bottom chart shows you the acres treated, and the blips were too small. So I put the numbers on there. And these are the acres of eradication, primarily down in the southeast and the um, metro area. And these were pretty much introductions on firewood, or, or things like that, things that people carried in, nursery stock like that were infested and they were locally eradicated. Again, the, the number of acres that were treated um, reflect in the latter years here the invasion from Wisconsin. So the North Shore treatments, they've been treating for a number of years, as you've seen in the previous graphic. This year, they treated 115,000 uh, 100 acres along the North Shore, and you can see, you know, it's selected pockets all along, including um, quite a bit of Duluth. And in downtown Duluth, they did some uh, spraying with BTK to um, kill some caterpillars 
um, because they had found some uh, trees infested with caterpillars um, in that area. In the metro, they had four treatment areas. Um, two of them were together in the Coon Rapids area. Um, and they treated 1,500 acres down there for eradication. And then I'm showing you the 2011 moth trap, which aren't, aren't final, but it's only going to fluctuate by a couple. And you can see the intensity along the North Shore. Those intense purple dots show that um, between 16 and 95 moths were caught in an individual trap. That's bordering on you know, maxing out the available trapping area inside the trap. So it's quite a bit. And this graphic um, uh, shows a couple things. First of all, basically we expect gypsy moths to spread relentlessly uh, from Wisconsin into Minnesota, and not just from the Bayfield area. As that front moves along that whole uh, westerly uh, flow, it's going to hit uh, both our states here. The US Forest Service has a pro program, which I'm sure you've heard of, called Slow the Spread. And the goal is to reduce the rate of spread by about uh, 50%. And in the graphic, you can see um, the what they're calling the projected um, rate of spread with and without the program. And with the, with the program, you can see in 25, in 20 years, I guess it is, that the range is only going to be a certain size versus it's going to be all the way through, almost all the way through the forest area of Minnesota um, without the SDS program in, in that time. And um, as of 2011, um, their spread, their experience exceeding their goals. They're reducing the spread rate by 65%. And basically, that's to less than six to five miles per year. And that's in all states across the entire front of the gypsy moth expansion. And that's, and that's pretty amazing, I think. The next uh, pest I want to talk about is um, emerald ash borer. And emerald ash borer, if you look at the coin, you can always remember gypsy moth uh, was found in 2002, and it was found in Detroit. So uh, that's when it was found and where it was found. And since then, it's spread uh, throughout the Midwest and in the Northeast. Um, it mines in the phloem, and it kills trees. It kills ashes of all sizes. And it kills 99 plus percent of all ash trees. Some do survive. That's the good news. Um, it's not an opportunistic pest because it will attack healthy as well as stressed ash trees. And the uh, important part to know is that the adults are active in June, July, and August. Our initial find was in Minnesota in 2009, and it was in the Twin Cities. In Minnesota, the Minnesota Department of Agriculture is the lead agency for, again, for detection, regulation, and mitigation. EAB is easily spread via firewood movement. So the DNR has instituted a fire, firewood approval system that we manage at the area level to limit the spread of EAB and other pests. Uh, biocontrol, the release of natural enemies, occurred at all known EAB sites in Minnesota by MDA this year. Three new infestations were found in 2011. Um, in the first two were in already infested Ramsey County, uh, but they were distant far enough distance away to be you know, considered kind of something new that they have to look at. So the first, tree, the first find was um, one heavily infested tree in Shoreview. And they detected no other trees nearby. So they're kind of wondering where that came from. Since then, they found some other woodpecker damaged trees. So they're thinking that that might be right in the vicinity. So they might they think that they caught it really, really early. And again, it was a, a private person finding it. There were five to six infested trees found near the intersection of Dale and Summit in St. Paul. Uh, they're, they're still surveying that. That's an um, area with big old trees. And I think that you know, almost have to climb those trees to find, uh, find what you're looking for. But the biggest find was 200 heavily infested trees down in uh, Nodine in Winona County. And that's, um, it was found at a quick trip on I-90 down there, um, right at the prairie forest edge, I guess, if you want to call it that. Um, it was within um, kind of the Great River Bluff State Park. And so a new quarantine was set up in Winona County. And they're uh, working right now on taking care of it, using it as a sort of a training session for local uh, forestry and parks people and also DOT people, and uh, getting them to recognize what's, what's going on there and talking about what are the options for management and taking care of it and how they're going to use the um, wood chips 
that are created uh, from that project. The last um, invasive I'm going to talk about is something that we do not have in Minnesota right now, and that is thousand cankers disease of black walnut. And basically, it's really what it means. It's really death by thousands and thousands of tiny cankers caused by an equally tiny uh, fungus, or uh, equally tiny beetle in a fungus. And the beetle is really tiny. If you look at the bottom picture on the left, that little brown thing down there, that's the beetle. That's the size of the insect. And it carries a fungus. And together, they cause the, the beetle boards in. The fungus is on the individual, and it um, creates an infection there. And in the next picture over, you can see an older dead twig there with uh, you know, hundreds of these tiny little exit holes and the fungal canker there. What, and it causes the tree to wilt to, and it causes dieback and then wilt and a slow death um, by attrition. Um, it is spread in walnut firewood, any live material, and in wood products, especially those with the bark on it, or anything that's not been treated. They don't think it's transported in the nuts or the nut meats. It has not been found in Minnesota, like I've said, but it has been found in Tennessee, Virginia, and Pennsylvania in the last two years. And that's really a depressing uh, situation, because it had not been found in the, the natural range of black walnut. It had just been found out in California and Oregon, where they have planted uh, black walnut to begin with. Uh, MDA, again, is a lead agency, and they had declared an external quarantine um, for walnut in Minnesota. And that is the blue stripes on the map. And you can see several other Midwestern states in the state of Virginia have also done um, that tactic. So we're inhibiting or preventing the spread of these live materials that could potentially carry um, this combo into, uh, into Minnesota. OK, now I'm going to switch to my final main topic, and that is the impact of climate change on forest insects and their damage. Well, when you start thinking about this, you have to think, well, OK, what, okay if we're going to have climate change, what, what, what am I really talking about here? So what, what are the expected climate changes in Minnesota? And um, this list, it's kind of a two-page list, um, was developed by Dr. Lee Freelich at the University of Minnesota. So I'm sharing that with you here. Uh, the first point, of course, is increased levels of carbon dioxide and um, ozone in the atmosphere. Um, we're going to have warming temperatures. And what that means is in the winter, our lowest temperatures will be warmer. And that we'll have uh, warming, uh, warmer summers, too. We'll have the growing season will be longer. And the graphic that I've shown you is the frost-free period um, in Grand Rapids starting in 1916 and going to 2006. And as you can see, the um, summers are getting longer. So that now, compared to uh, 1916, we have a one month longer growing season than we did before. We're going to have drier weather during the growing season. And um, if you look at the graphic, uh, the map there on the right, um, you can see this year's uh, departure from normal in terms of precipitation in September, October, uh, August, September, and October. And reading um, the climatology website, they say this is the driest three months that we've ever had on record. So um, it looks like it's starting to come true here. Uh, you can also look at the summer pre precipitation history graphic there with five-year tendencies. And so green is to the good. That's rainy, good weather for trees. And brown is dry and not so good weather for trees. And you can see the last few years are down in that um, level. And it's actually approaching the levels um, of the Dust Bowl era. So it's, it's getting pretty dry out there during the summer months. It may not be that so when you um, factor in the snowfall, but when the trees are trying to grow, it's been pretty dry. So um, the next point is very interesting, that although we're going to be very dry and hot, when <clears throat> we do get rain, storms coming in, it's going to be really high, hot and humid peaks uh, are going to occur in the summertime. So it might feel like Bombay, India, you know, in the middle of our summer and some of our, our worst storms. We are going to have more storms and more thunderstorms. The um, storm fronts are actually going to move north, and we're going to get more of the storms that are 
um, plaguing the Twin Cities area, that kind of weather. So we're going to have a lot of windstorms, more tornadoes, more things like that. Along with that, we're going to get less percolation of the water into the soil because, of course, the rain is going to come down in a very short time frame and it's going to have a lot of runoff. And we're also going to have more blowdown events in, because of the strength of the storm. So um, if we anticipate this warmer, drier, and windy weather, it's going to have an impact uh, then where temperatures are right now tend to be low up to be below optimal for insects. The temperature increases are going to accelerate their metabolism and activities like flying, eating, and reproducing. So I've, you know, you look around and you look in the literature and you find that somebody has come up with a pretty concise list of what's going to happen in this. In this case, it's Matt Ayers um, out of Dartmouth. And he said that climate change could do three basic things uh, for insect populations. And one is, the first thing is to directly affect their development, survival, and distribution. The second thing is to change the abundance of their natural enemies or their competitors. And the third thing is to change host tree physiology or defenses. You know, all this hot, dry weather likely makes the trees more vulnerable to insect attack. So I'm going to give you some uh, six quick examples to illustrate these three points. Okay, move my pointer. Okay, so with fast development, um, yeah, one of the things with warmer weather is that with faster development, you're going to have more generations per season due to the warmer weather and the longer summers. So, for example, pine bark beetles could move from two generations a year to three generations a year, especially in central Minnesota, but it could happen in northern Minnesota on an occasional basis in the next 20 years. Uh, with warmer weather, we could also have reduced insect mortality because the winters are going to be milder. They're not going to have those deep, cold uh, winter events. Uh, so we're going to have larger insect populations survive to emerge the following year. And in, case we've, in, 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 case, in this case, we've found that eastern larch beetles are overwintering in higher numbers because more adults are surviving. Historically, very few adults uh, would survive these cold weather events. And we're not having them very much anymore, so we're getting more and more large beetles surviving. And that's why we think, part of the reason why we think um, we're having the outbreak in the tamarack. With windier weather, we're going to have more insect movement, both local and landscape level. An example here, would, uh, I've already talked about um, the gypsy moth larvae being able to be lofted into the air. This, the same thing happens to spruce budworm moths. And they can be transported hundreds of miles along these cold front thunderstorms. So if you have more storms, you get more budworm movement, more defoliation, and then ultimately you'll get more spruce for mortality. With uh, windier weather, again, you're going to have uh, more insect habitat created by the increased blowdown events. We had a big blowdown event that I just told you about. And uh, they're going to ha have tons and tons of bark beetles, two-lane chestnut borers, and those sorts of things. Uh, benefiting because they are the opportunistic insects that this is their natural habitat and they'll build up. And if the weather's right, then they'd be able to move in uh, to local uh, live trees um, that haven't been affected by this. So you can have uh, some more impact from them than, than you'd think. Uh, with warmer and drier weather, you can have a disruption in the phenological synchrony between the insects and their natural enemies. Now, the example I'm going to show you here is the large case bear. Now, it's an exotic, I grant you that. But it was also um, controlled by the release of its natural uh, uh, parasites, also uh, exotics, in the Midwest, and especially in Minnesota. But recently, the population increases of large case bear are speculated to be caused by, this warmer, by these warmer temperatures that favored the defoliator over um, its controlling uh, parasite system. And the last. Um, um, examples that I want to give you um, are changes to tree physiology and defenses and making the trees more vulnerable to attack. And I have a little graphic down here. So as the, tree, the trees become more stressed, uh, they change their tree chemistry. And opportunistic pests can key in on these stress-related chemicals. At the same time, the tree is losing energy, losing energy, and losing energy. These opportunistic pests have the opportunity to attack. They're not repulsed by the tree. And so then they can successfully attack and kill the stressed trees. So the US Forest Service um, has developed a series of maps where climate change 
is likely to have an effect on 130 tree species in the North, Northeast USA, and the forest layer is based on the FIA plots. If you're interested in the website, I have it down below at the bottom. It's just a fascinating um, set of um, pic, um, pictures that if you want to look at it, it's just really illuminating. Um, and I've, I've looked at this for uh, you know a couple of years now, and in, in Minnesota we have uh, 12 of our 22 forest species will have hot spots of change strictly due to climate change and the stress. Um, and this is where um, affected tree species will be under stress and the tree population is likely to diminish. And these hot spots are the hatched populations. And you can see, this is an example of Aspen, and you can see in northern Minnesota, they have uh, hatched three different kinds of hatch marks up there, and those indicate the three different, or two or three different kinds of um, uh, scenarios that they have a high and low scenario. So with that then, if you combine those two theories that you have climate change, diminishing the population just because habitat is not going to be right for it. The other thing that's happening is in those cases where we have exotic pests, or not exotic pests, pardon me, opportunistic pests, those populations um, are going to, uh, the insects are going to accelerate the demise of these trees. And so um, Bob Hack, um, a noted entomologist, said to expect an accelerated impact from opportunistic pests when trees are stressed. Minnesota, we're looking at six of the 22 species um, have opportunistic pests. In the chart below, I've shown you um, three examples. Pine bark beetles on red pine in the hatched areas where we expect them to move out of their kind of range where they commonly work and move north and east and start attacking red pine in those areas on a more frequent basis as it becomes warmer, drier, and windier. Um, Aspen. The bronze aspen birch borer is their uh, opportunistic pest. And so when you have forest pink caterpillar outbreaks and uh, warmer, drier weather, um, bronze aspen borers are going to come in, and especially if you get climate change accelerating that. We're, those are the areas where they expect problems. And again, with the northern red oak, um, this is the, some, some of these areas are the typical areas where we have them, the, the gray areas on the bottom, but the new areas where they would expect uh, northern red oak, bur oak, and those things to have problems due to two-line chestnut borers and um, climate change would be up in the northeastern part of the state. Um, so I'd like to kind of conclude that to this little section here then to say that we'll see losses due to opportunistic pests that are an early indicator of climate change uh, in our forest ecosystem. Then I would like to, um, first of all, go over what we've talked about a little bit today. This is the, the same slide you saw before. Um, in our talk today, we've talked about the results of our aerial survey this year. We looked at what's new with three invasive insects and diseases in 2010. And just recently, we've gone over uh, the potential impacts of climate change on forest insect populations and their hosts. And right now, I'd like you to remind to remind you to type into the chat box any questions that you might have so we can answer them. But before I start uh, looking at those questions, I would like to thank Mike Kronke and Jean uh, Webke for hosting this webinar and making the technology work for us. Thank you, Jenna. This is a very, very interesting uh, webinar. You have lots of knowledge to share. And I'm sure that we have questions. We have one question up on board right now, Shelley. Um, it says in 2006, it shows relatively low numbers of gypsy moths detected. Why the high number of acres in the same year? Why the high numbers of acres treated? It, yeah, it was yeah. the acres number of treated. Um, well, there's a complicated, the slow the spread program in the gypsy moth um, program by the U.S. Forest Service. They have a very complicated a mathematical approach to working along the edge of the advancing front of the gypsy moth population. And they, over the years, have developed a system of predicting where it's going to, the populations are just poised to flush and, and really um, do um, damage. So what they do is they, they point those areas out, and in the states where those, the, leading, the bleeding edge, if, if you will, occurs, they go in there and kind of do some preemptive strikes with their mating disruption. 
um, those little pheromone flakes that they sprinkle all over. And so they're not really treating with pesticides. Those acres treated are uh, mating disruption. And what they're trying to do is inhibit um, the, the reproduction. You know, the, the, the little larvae are flying in. Um, they may or may not land. Where they do land, and they're female, and they make it to adulthood, uh, what they're trying to do is just sprinkle the area with mating disruption so these few females can't be found. And that's why they're treating those big areas. Um, you know, it didn't look like we had many moths, but the, the model predicted that we would be having some the next year, and, and, and we did. <laughs> OK, question from Casey. Is anyone still looking at ozone-specific damage to trees? I know the FIA uh, program did in their P3 plots, but heard that was being phased out. Yeah. Yes, there is a study. There is a big study going on, and it's a worldwide study um, called the FACE Project. And I don't remember what the acronym start, uh, stand for. But basically what they're doing is they have small plots of trees. One is in Rhinelander, Wisconsin. There's something in Europe. Uh, there's something on the East Coast, and there's something in Asia somewhere. Um, that they're looking, what they do is they pipe in these um, higher CO2 concentrations and higher O2 populations, O3 populations, uh, um, gases. And then they look at the insect and disease impacts and the growth impacts on uh, the trees. And they're looking at soil-borne organisms, the root borers, and those sorts of things, too. And um, basically, they've found kind of a mixed bag of results. What happens is with more carbon dioxide, the plants are able to grow better uh, up until a point. And then um, it's a mixed bag then for the insects and diseases, whether they're a drag on the system or whether, whether they uh, can help the tree at, at, at some level. So that research is going on. It's called the FACE, capital F-A-C-E project. Um, and it's by the US Forest Service. And so you can probably look that up online. Mike's question, will yep. oak wilt eventually impact most of the oak in Minnesota and in the Midwest? I would say that's a good question. Um, what we're seeing oak wilt being um, most easily spread on um, soils that have uh, are banded soils. And what I mean by that is there's um, think of a braided stream or something historically braided stream from the glaciation. And that meant sand, then gravel, then sand, then gravel, then sand, then gravel was kind of laid down. And in those kinds of sites, like the Anoka Sand Plain down by Wabasha, um, maybe somewhere, some places along the Mississippi River and that sort of thing, um, those areas, um, it spreads the best because local spread by root grafts because the roots are constrained to grow at the intersection between the sands and the, um, the gravel, so they root graft more easily. So in that regard, um, we have some spots where, you know, once it gets established, it could be, become very prevalent. Um, in other areas, we, we have a huge oak population, but it might not spread as well. Um, and so that's why we're trying to, you know, we've had a big campaign in the 80s and 90s down in the Twin Cities, even had jingles on the radios and things like that about uh, don't spread, you know, don't take your firewood north, um, your oak firewood north, because it could potentially be spreading oak wilt to the um, up, up north. And now we've got the fire, firewood program, so we're hoping that people will not be spreading it in their um, unseasoned firewood, too. I, I have high hopes that it's not, and we've kind of contained it and constrained it down in the Twin Cities areas for the last 30 years by active programs. And I'm hoping that um, we can keep it up. And I, again, it's that early detection and early eradication that's going to work um, if we do find it in the north. So we, we look for it actively every year. Question okay, from the area. Uh, what area. What, yeah. what okay. effects do you expect from this fall's drought? Um, from this fall's drought, um, well, I expect to see um, a decline in the vigor of the trees, you know, like the um, like we've talked about in this last section here, we're having a, a decline in tree health, which might make them more susceptible to these opportunistic pests. That could be totally erased by really nice spring rain and a nice growing season summer. 
Um, but if we have early season drought, when the insects are active and the trees have low energy and won't be able to repel them, um, we could have, you know, could be another start of a, um, an outbreak year for the opportunistic pests in 2012 and 13. And can you comment on the psycho distinction between northern Minnesota and Canadian spruce budworm outbreaks? Yep. The, um, the, the cycle in Minnesota is perennial. We always have something present uh, in Minnesota. And it even differs. The, there's actually three different areas, if you will, um, in Minnesota. Um, they've looked at the researchers, um, uh, Brian Sturdivant, in fact, with the Forest Service, has looked at um, the spruce budworm outbreaks in uh, like commercially managed forests in Canada, in the BWCA Quetico, and in um, the, the commercial forests in Minnesota. And basically, they've, he's discovered that uh, we have um, probably more of a natural system going on here still, because we have small harvests going on which mimic the impact of fire over the past, you know, um, millennia. In the Boundary Waters, the, um, you know, they've, they've done fire control for so many years up there that they're getting kind of a boom and a bust back starting again. And in the northern reaches where they're doing commercial harvest in Canada, they have a much longer periodicity. And budworm basically disappears from, from vast acreages in northern Canada. And then it will come back and be active, kind of wipe it all out, and then be gone for a number of years while, the, while it refoliates. And um, uh, it will be active down by Sudbury and down by Toronto and that. But then it will um, come back to northwest Ontario after a while. So it's, it's very interesting. I'd recommend reading that. Brian Sturdivant in the US Forest Service, if you're interested in finding more information. OK, I see that questions are, are slowing up here. Uh, so if there's any other questions, feel free to type them in. Otherwise, I want to say thanks again, Jana, for a, a very excellent program and, and sharing your expertise with the uh, Sustainable Forest Education Cooperative members. And I want to thank all of you uh, that are online. I, I see a Minnesota power person as well uh, as the other ones that I've mentioned and a few others have joined us. So welcome, all of you. and. Uh, I've been talking with uh, Jana about potentially having a forest health and invasive species workshop uh, later this spring of 2012. So we'll be uh, planning uh, that event and uh, hopefully getting it on the SFEC calendar. So keep that in mind as you look at other uh, SFEC events uh, uh, for the future. Our next uh, webinar is going to be January 17th. And uh, the title is going to be Force Applications of LIDAR Data. And the presenter um, is Paul Olstad. He's a professor of the Department of Forest Resources at the University of Minnesota. So keep that in mind. Uh, we have a whole series of webinars that the DNR Forestry are helping to co-sponsor and appreciate their co-sponsorship for those webinars. And then we have a couple other uh, programs coming up. <clears throat> Pardon me, uh, I have a little cold here. Um, so January 11th will be our annual research review. This year we're going to focus on wildlife. We have just all kinds of uh, presenters already uh, lined up, uh, including uh, moose and lynx and um, uh, neotropical birds and birds of prey. Should be a very, very interesting uh, uh, workshop. And then on the 9th, uh, on Rather, February 21st, Adaptive Management in the Face of Climate Change. I'm working with Tony D'Amato. We'll be hosting that workshop also at the Cloquet Forestry Center. We have some uh, leading researchers from throughout the, uh, the Midwest that will be presenting on climate change and adaptive management to climate change. So those are two big uh, programs coming up, so keep those in mind. So before we close, I see uh, Erica Hahn has one more question, and that is, will the PowerPoint be available? Yes, the PowerPoint will be available uh, on the SFEC website. Uh, so all of our webinars are archived for individuals to view. 
Um, all you need to do is go to the SFEC website. On the upper left-hand corner, you'll see View Past Webinars. You can click on that and then scroll down and click on the webinar that you'd like uh, to see or refer to other people. So, uh, any other questions, uh, comments? Otherwise, I want to thank um, Jenna Albers again for just an excellent uh, presentation. And I also want to thank uh, Gene Webke from Iowa State University who helps us with technical support of these webinars. So I look forward to seeing many of you in the coming months. And uh, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Thanks again, Jenna. Thank you.